Welcome to the latest episode of the Step Back Podcast here on Fanside. You can find us on all of your favorite podcast apps, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. We come to you at least once a week, always on Mondays. I'm Ethan Skolnick. You can follow me at Ethan J. Skolnick. And at Five Reasons Sports, we got Brady Hawk. You can find him at Brady Hawk 305. You can also find our Miami Heat podcast, Five on the Floor, on all of these same podcast platforms. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. No guests, just Brady and I. And we're just going to focus on one topic, which actually was brought to my attention kind of accidentally by a friend, Matt Moore, who uh, you know him as HP Basketball on Twitter. And he's worked at a bunch of different places. I believe he's now at the Action Network. And he just posted this screenshot of the Pacific Division and said, who wins this division? And every team, as we speak right now, is within one and a half games of each other. And we know that divisions in the NBA don't really mean anything anymore. They're not as significant as the NFL. They don't really guarantee you anything. They don't even guarantee you home court in the first round, but they do kind of show how much parity there is in the NBA this year. And I was just reading this as well, Brady, over the last 20 years, this is the most games that underdogs have won through the first half of the season. So there really is no clear cut best team in the NBA right now. There's not even like a clear cut best team in five of the six divisions. So we're going to go through all of the divisions. There's one division that's a bit of an outlier right now and we will play with that one and maybe go through who might finish second in that division but this is just for sort of educational purposes only uh we're not saying that the nba should put a greater emphasis on divisions or anything like that but uh, it does kind of show you again uh how there really is no team in the nba that has established itself as a clear favorite at this stage and again it's week to week thing so we're going to start in the atlantic which right now is one of the better divisions in the NBA. they got four teams over 500. I don't know that everybody thought there would be four. Most people thought there would be three. Um, And even one of those three was really struggling to start the year, and now they're on a hot streak, just beat the Heat last night as we speak, and they're the Nets. But going into this podcast, 40 or roughly they're all about 39, 40 games into the season, so roughly halfway the Celtics are 28 and 12. The Nets are 27 and 13, one game back. The Sixers, even with all their injuries, 24 and 15, three and a half games back. The Knicks, the surprise team, 22 and 18. So they're on roughly a 45 win pace, six games back. And then the Raptors, who I, I would have picked them third or fourth prior to the year, they're in last place, 11 games back, and maybe in a position where they may sell off assets. They're 17 and 23. So let's just start at the top of this division here. If I was to say to you right now, we, the Celtics, I guess, uh, by, a, by a hair, have won the division through the first half of the season. Who finishes the season with the top record? I think a lot of these are going to be close. I would think I would still lean Celtics right now, even though I feel like you, you just mentioned the Nets are one game back from them, and you see the way that they're trending. Like They are just really figuring things out. Uh, at, at the time we're recording, Kevin Durant just got hurt last night in Miami. So I know that still uh, could change some things, I guess, record wise and how things look, I guess, moving forward. But generally, I still trust the Celtics most. I feel like uh, in terms of what they could do on both ends, even though going back to the Nets, because we were at the Heat Nets game. And the one thing that stuck out more than anything, we know what the Nets are offensively, but I feel like they're just an underrated defensive team just because how lengthy they are and the things they can do in that manner. Uh, and just throw teams off and matchup wise, they could play with so many different elements that they're makes them so intriguing. But the two best teams in the East right now are in the Atlantic uh, division. So it's like, it, it really is a toss up. I think the Celtics definitely, I think are going to end up in a higher seed in the regular season, but you mentioned it. The the fact that the, the Raptors, the only team under 500 in this division is wild considering the fact, I, I think we would both agree that they would at least be at 500 uh, at the halfway mark. Like if there was a team that would be in that range, you would think the Raptors would just because they always kind of figure that out in the regular season and just have an identity. Uh, obviously that hasn't been the case so far this season, but uh, it's definitely, this is a good, a good, I think a lot of these divisions are good examples, but this is a good example of what uh, are, we're seeing in terms of parity because it really could be a toss up. It could be those top two teams, the 76ers, if they get healthy, could get on a run. So it's, it's really a toss-up in that way, but I do lean Celtics. I'm going to go with Celtics first, and we're going to look back at these at the end of the season and see where we end up. I, I think the Celtics do win this division. I, I think that inconsistency will come to the Nets again. I, like you, was impressed by their length, their depth, their versatility at this stage, which they I don't think is something they had 
the past couple of seasons, and obviously Durant and Kyrie are playing at a high level. As we say that, we'll probably find out something's wrong with Kevin Durant on his MRI because you and I have this jinx where anytime we talk about somebody within three hours of the podcast posting, it becomes obsolete. So hopefully that's not the case uh, for KD and for us. But I, I would expect that the Celtics win this division. I, I think the more interesting race is going to be for second. Um, because I do think that as Philadelphia gets healthier, Maxi gets into the fold, if they can keep Embiid on the court, I, I like the Nets' be- depth better than Philadelphia's right now. Um, but And they're both kind of dysfunctional in different ways uh, with the off-the-court stuff, and they share a lot of that in common. Obviously, James Harden's played for both recently. That tends to lead to it. Uh, but I, I – and as has Ben Simmons – uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to lean uh, Celtics, Nets, Sixers, just as it is now, uh, to end the season. I think the one thing that may flip is if the Raptors don't sell off, I wouldn't be stunned if they get past the Knicks for fourth. That, that would be the one thing I would look at. I still think they have better talent than the Knicks. It's just that everybody's been out at one time or another, and they haven't been able to get any rhythm. But for right now, uh, I'm going to say eh, I'll give the Raptors a, at least a 50% chance, uh, even though right now they're they're five games back uh, to get past the Knicks. All right, let's look at the Central Division here. And this is one I don't think anybody thought would be this close at this stage, uh, even with the injury to Middleton early because they kind of got past that. They are playing pretty well, but now they're struggling some. The Bucks are, are four and six in their last ten. And the Cavs have caught them. I mean, the Cavs aren't even uh, playing at the level they were earlier in the year, but those teams are tied atop the division. And look at this, Indiana, uh, third in the division at 23 and 18. They're on a 46-win pace as we speak. That looked like one of the five worst teams in the Eastern Conference prior to the year. They're still ahead of the Bulls, even though the Bulls have been rolling lately. The Bulls have won 7 out of 10 themselves. Then, of course, the Pistons we all expected uh, to be in tank mode this year. The Bucks and the Cavs. I, I think we're both going to th- agree that the Bucks are going to win that division. But uh, is it going to be close? I think it could be. Uh, I still – I think it comes down to – and this is going to be the case for anything we talk about, but it comes down to, to health. <laughs> like the fact of what it, what is the number that Chris Middleton plays in the regular season, uh, kind of the role players around Giannis, how are they kind of stay, kind of – uh, standing around him at that point at the regular end of the regular season. But the Cavs are playing really good basketball right now. Uh, and as I've talked about a lot, it's funny how we're comparing the two in this division because the Cavs have almost like molded their play style to the Bucks in a lot of ways. Obviously, it's different because the, the Bucks top player is Giannis, who's more of an interior threat. Dalvin Mitchell, more of a guard perimeter threat. But defensively, they've basically said we're going to do the exact same thing the Bucks have been doing with basically uh, having a rim protector, just kind of sit around the rim in that drop coverage and kind of not want a bunch of rim attempts and having kind of a lengthy, versatile four that's going to guard the perimeter, uh, weak side help the entire time. The only difference is the Bucks have an absolute elite point of attack defender in Drew Holiday, whereas the Cavs, they don't really have that, but you're seeing them build a base in a similar way. So will that kind of... Uh, be the same case throughout the season will that be sustainable i think so like i think that that's pretty sustainable throughout a regular season and we'll see how the offensive stuff comes behind but it really comes down to health and if both teams are, are at a similar place that they are now uh i think the bucks end up finishing higher even though i've seen a lot of people kind of like jumping off the bucks bandwagon a little bit because of these little kind of shaky moments but it's still i, I feel like what we're seeing is like Nothing to really like be too worried about. Like these are just little shakeups out of regular season where I still trust the Bucks more. I trust Giannis. Even that's a guy in the regular season. We talk about guys that like uh, maybe don't go as hard throughout the regular season. They pace themselves. Giannis is going 100 percent no matter the matchup throughout the regular season. So I just I trust them to finish higher in general. Yeah, I'm going to take them as well. Uh, one thing to look at here, though, one thing I would say is in the Cavs' favor. The Cavs have played really well inside the division, and you do end up with more division games typically in the second half of the season. The NBA structures it that way some. Uh, they're 7-3 and three inside the division. The Bucks are 4-3. and three. But the one the one number that's actually been a great number for the Cavs this year but is not really sustainable, they're 6-0 and oh in overtime this year. Uh, Cleveland is uh, they've won. They went through a stretch where they were losing a lot of those close games, but now they've won some of those close games, which is the sign of a team's growth. Uh, and it is important as you go into the playoffs, but I think some of those turn the other direction. Uh, the thing about the Cavs is though, 
I don't know necessarily that they're going to load management guys. They don't have a lot of older players. Um, the Bucks may do some load management as the season goes on, whether it's with Drew, whether it's with Middleton. And they might give Giannis – I know he likes to go 100%. That's one of the reasons I think they may give him some nights off as the year goes on. So that could make it closer than it should be. But I think I just think the Bucs are better. I, I think the Bucs are better. I think they win that division. I think, the, the, again, we go down a bit. The more interesting race is for three. Um because Chicago was projected to finish, even though I, I think you and I acknowledge Chicago's holes before the year, but I think we thought they'd finish ahead of the Pacers. But now um, the Bulls are playing extraordinarily well, but the Pacers haven't really let up. And it doesn't appear that the Pacers are going to make a trade to gut this thing. It seems like uh, Rick Carlisle wants to kind of push through with the, with Miles Turner and Buddy Heald. Who would you, I mean, the Pacers still have a significant lead for the three spot there. Who would you take? I think I would lean Pacers, and I feel like we're just taking the teams <laughs> that are higher up right now every time. But I just like the trends that we've seen uh, from the Pacers in general. I think I trust their young guys more because, like you said, we could see, to your point about Cavs and Bucks, like we could see uh, some Bulls guys sit out and miss games. Like I just trust the Pacers guys to actually play, and they're playing a really unique style in terms of uh, having kind of guards that are – kind of passive in a way where they're getting into the paint. You have Buddy Heald who's kind of your shooter. Uh, you have more of your young perimeter guys. Then you have Miles Turner kind of holding it down on the defensive end. I just like their roster right now. And, and like you said, that's kind of the thing. We've seen kind of fun young rosters that just don't pan out or they'll just fall apart in the second half of the season. But it doesn't seem like they're going in that direction, as you said. It seems like they're going to keep these kind of core players intact. And if they do uh, – I don't know. It doesn't seem like the Bulls, even though they're kind of winning games, it doesn't feel like they're all figured out yet where it feels like they're heading toward a spot where they go on another losing streak where, where things start to fall apart again. And then all of a sudden you're hearing more rumors about the locker room issues and stuff. So I just trust the Pacers more, I guess, uh, to kind of finish, I guess, around maybe that eight range to try to just make a make a late push in the plan. I, I think when we look at the divisions, uh, one of the reasons it may matter a little bit more than usual as because as, as executives try to get a handle on where their teams are, they're gonna uh, the division teams are the most familiar to them. And I think if you're if you're Chicago's management and you're like, okay, we're still trailing Indiana, a team that was not supposed to be in this position this year, it may be the kind of thing that encourages you to go the other direction. Honestly, so I, I feel like the Bulls' recent hot streak has put off. You and I talked on, I think, on five on the floor about you know which teams might sell off, and the Bulls were one of those teams we were talking about as a possible sell off team that the Heat could kind of jump on uh, some of their players. But it, it that this recent Bulls streak may have lessened that. And again, they're a big market team; they don't want to sell off uh, usually. Big market teams don't want to do that and kind of break it down total to the beginning, uh, particularly in that market. Uh, where uh, some of the other teams have been struggling as well. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll say that I, I think the Bulls, I think they give it like two or three weeks here to see where it is. If they're still trailing Indiana, I wouldn't be surprised if they're sellers before the deadline. So that would be the only reason I would go with, with Indiana over them. Otherwise, I, I think the Bulls still have more material than Indiana does. I like the way Indiana is trending. I feel like the Bulls should finish ahead of them as long as they don't sell off. All right, let's go to the weak link. Um, let's go to the weak link for Miami's sake. If only divisions mattered more, right? Because the heat have owned this division for a long time. Uh, but this one is awful. Uh, the heat are 21 and 20 uh, below all reasonable expectations after uh, finishing first in the East last year, they are trending better. You and I have talked about that. Even Eric Spolscher talked about that yesterday that he likes where they're going. Uh, Oladipo has, has rounded into shape and has become a factor they finally cleared out the Dwayne Deadman dead weight out of the rotation. And, you know, they are positioned to potentially make a trade once we get past January 15th. And we're going to talk about uh, some of those players next week uh, that have become available for trades. It's going to be one of our major topics, but th they're still leading the division. They're, they're a game and a half up on Atlanta, which is all over the place. Um, and they are uh, three and a half up on Washington Orlando has maybe been sort of the most promising of the tanking teams. We've discussed this, but they're still, you know, going the other direction. They're on a 30 win pace. They're 15 and 25. And then the Hornets have been awful. They're on a 22 win pace. I mean, we're basically talking Miami and Atlanta, right? So 
do you do you give the Hawks a chance to to chase down Miami? I mean, Miami's not going to sell off, so we know that. So it's it's only a game and a half difference right now. Yeah, I'll say there's a chance, but I honestly feel like, and maybe this is because we cover the team so often, but I think the Heat pretty much can wrap this division up as they head into kind of the second half of the season. I I've talked a lot about after Heat wins where I'm not moved by certain wins where I just say like th- this trend is not going in the right direction. Uh, either the, the defense has been falling off the map or the offense in the half court has been problematic. Uh, they've had a really good road trip that they went three and two on and they followed it up with the Nets game at home where they lose at the very end. Uh, but it was very good trends in that game where you ma- it makes you feel better about where they're kind of going in general. The health is kind of the biggest question because Tyler and Dan both got a little banged up in that game. Uh, but I think they're heading at least in the right direction where they're kind of finding out their identity. I think Victor Oladipo, uh, his kind of resurgence has been big for, for my confidence, I guess, in this roster as it stands, because I think we can both agree that uh, we are going to be talking about different players on this Heat roster as we head past February, or we should be talking about different players because this team needs to make a certain move by some point. Uh, and if they do that, I think they can for sure wrap up this division. As you said, like this is, <laughs> you, I, we're going to go over some of these Western Conference divisions, and it's like there's some divisions that are just packed, like with just a bunch of teams packed in that can really win the division. This one's just a bunch of uh, teams that are looking at who if they can get the number one or number two pick in the draft, kind of. So it's, it is between the Heat and Hawks. I think the Hawks are kind of a mess. They, it's funny because the, these teams, if you look at like the the points per game and, and opposing points per game, they're just polar opposites where the heat are not putting up a ton of points per game, but they're allowing pretty few and the Hawks are putting up 115 points a game, but they're giving up 116 where it's like they're, these two teams are going in different directions where they're kind of finding their identity in, in equal ways. But I don't know if you could bet on that Hawks team that's giving up that many points and you're basically just betting on Trey Young efficiency. So I, I'm definitely leaning my end. All right, so let's go to the Western Conference. Now, I am as well. I, I, I just – I mean, maybe it's, again, familiarity with the organization, but I, I can't see them finishing behind Atlanta this year. I just can't. Um, I mean, you look at the conference record. The Heat have actually played better against the West than the East. The Heat are 8-12, and 12, and they do have a bunch – their schedule the rest of the year is difficult. That's the one thing. The strength of schedule, most of the metrics have the Heat as the top three hardest schedule the rest of the year, so that is a little concerning. They haven't played particularly well at home. 11 and nine. So there's a bunch of kind of weird numbers with Miami. This That's a year. good thing though. They, they play terrible yeah. against bad teams. So at least they'll play up to certain competition. Yeah, that's true. I think this is a big week for them as we speak. Uh, you know, OKC, which we're going to talk about that division in a second, but then they get the two against Milwaukee. They got to get at least, they got to get two of these three. Uh, they just got, they have to build some kind of momentum, but Again, I think people are sick of us talking about that. So we're sick of talking about it too. But I'm with you. They're trending the right way. I don't see Atlanta enough, but I'll just say with Atlanta, it just always seems like something's a little off. Like there is, you know, Murray's been a great acquisition, but the pieces don't totally fit. The noise with Trey that's coming out of there. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I, they got on the hot streak two years ago after Nate was hired. I, I don't really see another one coming here. Right, let's go to the Western Conference, and we're going to have to do this one differently because this is the only division where a team leads by more than, I guess, a, a game and a half, which is Denver. Uh, they've run away with this thing, and they're 16-3 and three at home. They're 8-2 and two in their last 10. They've built out their rotation with better defense, and, and Jokic is an MVP candidate. We don't really need to discuss them. They're going to win this division, right? We, we're, we're, in, we're in agreement on this. Yeah, for sure. We're we're just looking at who's getting second in this division. All right, so let's look at second because that's more interesting. Is that now you got two through five are separated by one and a half games, and a couple of these teams should not be in this mix. Okay, Minnesota currently, I guess, is the co-leader with Portland, uh, but then Utah is only a game back, and OKC is only a game and a half back. And those are two teams we thought would be tank type teams this year. They they basically they along with the Pelicans, those three teams own all the draft picks in the NBA for the next six years. Uh, and yet those teams, I mean, Utah has slipped a bit of late. They, they're, they're three and seven in their last ten. Portland three and seven in their last ten. OKC's playing pretty well though. They won six out of their last ten. I mean, Minnesota has to be the best of these teams to justify the trade they made. Will they be? Honestly, I don't think so. To be honest, I, I 
they're definitely going in different directions right now because I do think this is between Portland and Minnesota. I feel like the Thunder are going to tail off. I think we know the direction Utah is going in right now after the kind of fast start. Uh, but recently, the Timberwolves, have, they won four in a row. They were they lost six in a row, then they win four in a row. Uh, so they're going in a little bit of a positive direction. While the, the Blazers, after they kind of got out to a fast start as well, uh, they're three and seven in their last ten and lost three in a row. So uh, as much as I say that, I still trust the Blazers more. Like, I, I just don't really trust what we've seen from the Timberwolves. I think that they're just so inconsistent in a way you don't know what you're getting play style-wise on a regular basis. I think a lot of their top scores are – uh, too inconsistent offensively to really kind of pinpoint a run here. Like it's just really tough where at least the Blazers have a decent structure. Uh, I've enjoyed the play of their role players. I think they've figured out certain things um, defensively, like in terms of opposing points per game, they've been the best defense in this division. Uh, so I think they have figured enough out there. They've gone into some small ball regions. Uh, and as long as Damian Lillard's healthy, they're going to have a decent offense on a night to night basis. Anthony Simons is obviously improving. Uh, throughout this season as well. I just trust the Blazers a little bit more, uh, but it really, once again, it comes down to health because what does Carl Anthony Towns' status look like moving forward? Is Damian Lillard going to play a decent amount of games throughout the second half of the season? It really comes down to that, but in, in terms of if I'm guessing health, I still lean the Blazers to kind of figure it out and get in that play in mix. Yeah, I'm with you on that too. Um, I, the, the Towns-Gobert thing had, was never figured out before Towns got hurt, and that's concerning to me as you're heading towards the end of the season. Uh, I, I think Minnesota has the best personnel of these groups. I think they're the most dysfunctional of these four teams. I just think you may see OKC uh, continue to try to go the other direction as we go forward. I don't know that Utah needs to, honestly. Um, I don't know if they're going to sell off Markkanen. That would change a lot for Utah in terms of slipping behind OKC. I don't think they're going to go ahead of Portland and Minnesota. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with you too and say – Portland. Let's go to the Southwest division. Uh, three teams in the mix here. Let's forget the Spurs and the Rockets. Uh, the Grizzlies, the Pelicans, the Mavericks. Right now, the Grizzlies two and a half up on the Pelicans. The Mavericks are four back overall, but have won eight out of ten. Uh, and you know, but, but they haven't been able to really make up any ground on Memphis because Memphis has won six in a row. I, you know, I, Zion being hurt changes this. I, maybe they might have challenged for the first spot, but at this point, it's Memphis, isn't it? Yeah, honestly, if if before this kind of Zion injury, I think I might have honestly leaned Pelicans. I, I think they con- honestly, if they got healthy with Ingram back and all of that stuff, I think they could have made a run for that first in the division, but uh, now they have to go a decent that chunk of time without Zion and try to figure out. And they've done it in the past. We've seen what they did last season in the postseason and, and made decent runs. But it's just tough over over a long period of time when you kind of take over a certain play style and base an entire system around Zion where everything runs through him on the offensive end. And then all of a sudden, now you have to change back to your, your ways before and try to figure out things more perimeter-like and more into the McCollum's hands and role player shooting. So... Uh, I think the Grizzlies are, are trending in a different direction in terms of injuries with Desmond Bain coming back and kind of getting right in terms of that. And they've won six in a row. They're seven and three in their last 10. Uh, I trust the Grizzlies. The question becomes, because look, this, this division has the second, third, and fourth best teams of the Western Conference when you talk about mm-hmm. being packed. So is it going, can the Mavs catch their game and a half behind the Pelicans? Yeah. So it really comes down to, I wonder if the Mavericks, honestly, if, if the play of Luka could just continue to be what he's been. I think they were 8-2 and two in their last 10. If he could catch the Pelicans throughout this time, and I think he probably can. I think they do catch the Pelicans over maybe the next month, but the question becomes later in the season as Zion comes back, I think it's going to be kind of a neck and neck, neck and neck race. Yeah, I'm with you on Dallas. I, I think they catch the Pelicans. The Zion injury is going to be difficult to overcome. I, I What I was waiting for with the Pelicans was getting Zion with Ingram together. We've seen this a lot, like the teams that have needed to – to integrate one guy with another and then one guy gets hurt and you just don't get any consistent. I think that's a big reason. If we were to identify the biggest reason why there's been such inconsistency and parity in the league this year, it's the injuries, but it's not like the catastrophic injuries. It's not like, okay, this guy goes out and he's out for the year and you've got to adjust. It's been like guy out for a week, guy out for two weeks, guy out for three weeks. And it's been key guys. And so, and it's been with a lot of teams that have needed to see what these combinations look like. And you never really get to see it. Again, we've seen this in Miami, right? It's like every time you feel like you got one guy back, but there's six more guys on the injury report. And so 
I, until you're going to get that, and we're going to talk about that in the Pacific because this is the biggest example of that in the Pacific Division right now. But that's kind of what we're looking at. I just think when you have uh, Luca, I, I expect them to finish second in the division. I, I think I, I don't like the rest of their team at all, but he's that good. And so I just think that we're going to we're going to see them in the second spot. All right. Let's look at the West because this is what inspired this. What a mess. Um, as we speak, the Sacramento Kings, who haven't made the playoffs in was 15, 16 seasons, are leading. Uh, they're 20 and 18 even though they've lost a couple in a row. By the way, as we speak right now in the Pacific, the reason this is tightened up is uh, all four of the quote-unquote top teams are on losing streaks. So the Warriors is pretty small. It's just two. But uh, the Kings are not are four and six in their last ten. The Clippers are three and seven in their last ten. They've lost six straight. And the Suns are one and nine in their last ten and have lost six straight. And because of that, LeBron going nuclear in the past week and a half, and then the Lakers getting that win against the Heat, which I'll never understand without LeBron or AD, have won five in a row. Um, So all of a sudden this thing's tightened up where it's the Kings lead, but all the other teams are within two games. And you had two teams that, well, three teams here that were considered to be title contenders, the Warriors, the Clippers, and the Suns. None of them are over 500. So this one is harder for us, okay? (laughs) Who wins this division? Which star comes back the quickest? Because you look at this, the Lakers need AD coming back. The Suns need Devin Booker coming back. Both teams need – specifically, let me just start with those two teams. You look at the fact that the Lakers cannot defend right now. They're winning games offensively, where it's like AD is their entire defensive structure. You move on to the Suns. They can't score right now. Like their offense cannot be figured out because it's so based on Devin Booker. Like they're so similar in this way. Uh, and then you get to the Warriors where they've kind of been able to win some games here and there. Uh, but ultimately they're in the mix as well. So if Steph could come back, I, I honestly lean Warriors. I think the Warriors can figure out most in the regular season. Uh, but it's tough. Like there's just all these teams that are playing good basketball. And I don't want to just count out the Kings or the Clippers as well, specifically the Kings because they're playing so well. And I feel like we're all waiting for like that that kind of slippage over a week or two span where it's kind of bound to come, but I like the way they're playing. I like their roster. Uh, I feel like that's a team that uh, with the moves they've made, they're bound to make a a move at the deadline to kind of just, just improve the roster a decent amount to kind of make that little bit of another run, which puts them in a different tier in general. But I think I do lean more but it really does. Every one of these teams uh, kind of have a primary guy waiting to come back. So it comes back to that. And I was looking at some of the numbers you were going over. The weirdest one is the fact that the Suns are, you mentioned one and nine in their last 10, but they're seven and zero in this division. Like they, yeah, I just saw that. They're yeah. dominating this division. The Warriors have a weird trend where they just cannot win on the road. They, they, like they're 17 and four at home. They're three and 16 on the road. Like there's so many weird trends in this division where it's like, it's so hard to predict anything. And then the Lakers Talk about unpredictability. Like, you don't know what you're getting from a a game-to-game basis from this Lakers team because they could go on a five-game winning streak like we've seen, and then they could fall apart. So it's an awkward division. So this is the definition of parity. (laughs) Like, this is it. Well, an interesting group of coaches, too. I mean, Mike Brown's done a great job with Sacramento. Darvin Ham's in his first year with the Lakers trying to manage that. But then you've got three proven guys in Lou, uh, um, Monty and and Kerr with the others and you're just kind of waiting for all of them to kind of steer the ship the right direction and they haven't been able to do it uh it's just uh, as you and I who are stuck on the heat so much it's just interesting because I, I wonder what's going on in the podcast in these cities uh Golden State well Los Angeles I'm not sure they care about that team but but Phoenix I'm gonna go a different direction I I actually am gonna I, I can see your point on the Warriors you know, and when Steph comes back, you'd figure they start rolling again. They're going to have to play a little bit better on the road for sure, I would think. But I'm I'm going to say Phoenix um, because I, I think we have seen how important Booker is to them. And I, I just I don't know. They've they felt to me like a regular season team. So I think like they're going to get it together in the second half of the year. The Clippers, I just, I just don't know. I, I, I love the material on that roster, uh, but Kawhi is he ever going to be in there uh, all the time? It's tough. I mean, the craziest part of all this is after everything that happens. Okay, everything that happened, LeBron, you know, pulling Sam Amick aside in in the hallway the other night and basically saying, you know, what the f needs to happen here. 
if the Lakers finally cave and give up those picks. And now what's funny is now because of the parity in the league, this is affecting them too, because maybe Indiana doesn't want to trade Heald and Turner, which we've talked about, which is where the Lakers seem to be targeting before. But if they were to trade to get some shooting, to get somebody out on the perimeter, because you talk about their offense has been better. It's weird. Their offense was awful, historically bad for the first month of the year. And now you say that, that as you say, that they're carrying it. If they got some shooting compliments to LeBron, AD comes back. It's not the craziest thing to say they could win this division. Like, I, I mean, they're going to be energized by LeBron's push for, um, you know, for the scoring title, which is going to happen here, you know, sometime in uh, around February, March. I, I don't know. I mean, I think the only team that, that I can't see winning this division is Sacramento. And maybe it's just prior history. But they have the healthiest group right now. Like, uh, right? I mean, Fox is there. Sabonis is, right? So, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, you got a lot of all-stars in this division. Uh, you got a lot of big names in this division. Like, you could just hold a play-in with this group and people would watch it. Uh, I'm going to lean Suns to get it back together. They know what their game is when Booker is there. I feel like that will come back. The Warriors... Yes, when Steph comes back, I, I, to me, they would be next. Um, but I don't know. Something's been off with that bench and that young group the whole season. And they're they're kind of – they're taxed. I mean, they, they can't spend any more money, like I don't think. I mean, they're so far in a luxury tax. I don't think they're going to get it. I wouldn't be surprised if the Suns make a move. They just got a new owner, um, and, and I think he may be wanting to make a splash show. He's different from Sarver. Uh, he does have the means to do something. So I'm going to lean Suns over Warriors. I wouldn't be stunned if it's the Clippers. I wouldn't be just stunned if it's LeBron. I would be a little bit stunned if it's the Kings. But, to, you know, with all due respect to our friend Mark Jones, but right now they're lighting the lamp. They do lead. So, I, you know, I uh, halfway through the season, usually if the Kings start well, usually by now it tapers. It doesn't seem like it's tapered at this point. So, I don't know. Who, who would be your second choice? Is it the Suns? Oof. Uh... I mean, I could see your point, but I just don't trust what I've seen, to be honest. They'd probably be around third. Uh, honestly, maybe this is biased to what we've seen in the first half. I think I'm higher on the Kings than you are. I think I'm a little – I think I trust them a little bit more because I feel like a lot of these teams – I mean, like I keep saying, it, health is so big, but, like, <laughs> they've been the healthiest. Like, and I'm not saying that's going to be the case the entire season, but they, they at least have found their base and they haven't kind of wavered from it where these other teams have been – they can drop out so quickly from what they are. So honestly, I think I'd go Warriors and maybe King second, to be honest. Well, we'll see what happens. But all we know is if we're going to have one year where they should have made the divisions matter more, it's this year. Because can you imagine the races that we'd be looking at for these teams all within a game or two games of each other and kind of the the way that they would be jockeying for position at the trade deadline? Uh, a little bit different now that they don't mean as much, but an interesting exercise <laughs> even so. All right, next week – or maybe even later this week, we're going to get into some of the players that become available for trade on January 15th, how that may affect things, and where each team may be able to find a player that changes this dynamic as we go forward. Uh, check out the podcast every single week here on Fansided and on the Fansided website and on the team sites as well as all the podcast channels. Also check out Five on the Floor. Have a good day, everybody.